this opportunity to join you in your house. Uh, give us grace, Lord, and a sense of your presence. Fill us with your spirit. Draw our hearts to you this morning as we seek to draw near. Come, Lord, and feed us with word and sacrament. We might be uh, more and more your people. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we pray that your grace, that your continual mercy, O oh Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading and hearing of God's word. A reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15, beginning with the 15th verse. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I, called, for I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? There, therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll do them all. A reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 26, beginning with the first verse. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity, redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground in the great assembly. I will bless the Lord. The word of the Lord. A reading from the book of Romans, chapter 12, beginning with the first verse. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have all the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having the gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does the acts of mercy with cheerfulness. 
The word of the Lord. Would you stand now, please, and join as we pray the prayer for our children. Oh, gracious God, our Heavenly Father, keep watch over our children in this unsteady and confusing world. Mercifully care for them and teach them that your ways give abundant life. Again, give us strength to stand firm in Christ Jesus, our Lord, so that they might never know a day apart from you who with the Son and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Reading from the 16th chapter, beginning at the 21st verse. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in return for his soul? But the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. And now, Father, I pray, come. Continue this morning to pour out your spirit upon us. Open our minds, our hearts, our ears to your word. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. I think it's hard to have an accurate opinion of ourselves. Uh, while some have low self-esteem, too low an opinion of themselves, I think more of us 
and I'll just say the guys, because I am one, I can talk like a guy. More of us guys, I think, more high, we think more highly of ourselves than we should. I got a lesson in this back when I was an attorney back in the day. We had a case in our office that went up on appeal to the Fourth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia. That's one of the 11 circuit courts right below the U.S. Supreme Court, so it was a big deal. It was the kind of case that the senior partner handles. And so I was pleased when the senior partner asked me, a lowly associate, to go with him to Richmond for the oral argument. I, I had worked a lot on the case. I'd written the brief. And so I thought, I assume, the senior partner you know, wanted me in the car with him an hour and a half, two hours down to Richmond because we could talk about the case and the strategy and go, go over it one more time. And indeed, he did need my help. He needed my help because he'd hurt his back and he couldn't carry his briefcases. <laughs> and he, need me to, he needed me to carry his bags. Literally, I was his bag carrier. There was no talk of strategy or the case or anything else. He drove, I carried his bags, and I had a lesson in having too high an opinion of oneself. Maybe you heard the story about the older guy, probably my age, who had a high opinion of himself. And, and at the gym, he saw an attractive young woman, and he asked his trainer, which of the machines he should use so that he could impress her and be more attractive to her. And his trainer said, use the ATM. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm making <laughs> We identify, right? Don't we? I'm sorry. I'm making light of what Paul does not make light of in our epistle, where he cautions Christians, all of us, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but to think with sober judgment. And for Paul, this is a high priority for Christians. In, in, in the context here of this lesson, it's part of our not being conformed to the ways of the world. It's part of our ability to discern and do God's will, how to assume the rightful role that God has for us in the church, which depends somewhat on our understanding our gifts and thinking rightly of ourselves with sober judgment, not too highly. Paul knows that thinking too highly of ourselves is easy for us. We come by it naturally. Pride, after all, was the first sin of humanity. And we can see it in Peter in our gospel lesson this morning. Peter has just led, that was last week's lesson. Peter has just led his fellow disciples in recognizing Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you know, great job, Peter, and gives him a pat on the back. And now here it is, maybe days, maybe only hours later, and Peter is rebuking Jesus, telling Jesus what to do, telling him how to be the Messiah, telling God the Son the future not thinking of himself with sober judgment. And Jesus' harsh reply, his rebuke, proves the seriousness of Peter's offense. Get behind me, Satan, he says. You are not on God's side. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't really be that comfortable with Jesus calling me Satan. Thinking of ourselves too highly comes naturally because pride comes naturally. We naturally see ourselves, and I'll just talk about myself, I, as we, this is how we see ourselves, more attractive, thinner, wiser, less critical, standing up straighter, kinder, all of that, than we really are. But that's not the real problem. No, the real problem is that we, Paul's concern here is that we're thinking of ourselves as more holy, more righteous, more obedient to God, more fulfilling of God's will and purposes than we really are. And in all humility, I do think that that's what we all do. Or we tend that way. It's the bad news this morning, I think, that none of us are very close to living the kind of life that God sets out in Scripture, the kind of life that he created us to live, the kind of life that we're empowered by Christ and the Holy Spirit to live. That, I think, is where we all think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And I'm 
going to make my case this morning with each of our readings this morning. Each of them describes a life of faith that I think we, well, we can scarcely imagine. We can't really conceive of living. In fact, I don't think a lot of the time, speaking for myself, that I even aspire to it. It is so out of reach. Let me show you what I mean. Look at Jeremiah the prophet. He says God's, word were, God's words were found. Well, they were found by Jeremiah, and he ate them. He ate God's word. He devoured them. It's poetic. Jeremiah is saying, I loved his word. I couldn't get enough of his word. They were a joy and a delight to my heart. Can we imagine you and I saying that about Scripture? Maybe at one point in our Christian walk we were kind of there with the Bible. I don't know. But don't we, do we live in that, that we, we can't get enough of the Scripture? It's our food. It's our delight, our joy. And Jeremiah sought holiness. He didn't join in revelry or take part in pagan worship. He didn't watch those Netflix series that keep coming along to entertain us. He wasn't into that. Ungodliness of his fellow Jews. We see in Jeremiah a man set apart, holy to God's purposes. Holy, H-O-L-Y. Even when it meant persecution and suffering, which it did for most of his life. And then look what the psalmist says about himself this morning. Could any of us say this? If we did, we'd be accused of pride and lack of humility. The psalmist says he's lived with integrity. He's trusted God without faltering. Examine me, he says to God. Can you imagine saying this? He says to God, examine me. He says it with confidence. He says he's walked faithfully, rejected evildoers, washed his hands in innocence. He loves the Lord's temple. He loves to worship, and he's kept himself holy so that he could enter the temple and worship at God's altar. Now, I'm not faulting anybody for staying home. <laughs> it's COVID-19, and we're concerned about infection and a deadly disease. Do we have that sort of desire, that sort of love of God and of worshiping in his temple? The psalmist is giving us a picture of love for God and trust in God, a man seeking after God and his presence with a passion. And then in Romans, Paul is telling the church how to live the Christian life. <laughs> Tough stuff. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's how Paul defines worship singing songs or even reading God's word or, or coming to church on Sunday morning, but giving up our very lives, a living sacrifice to God, letting God have everything, ourselves in every sense. He tells us to reject the world's ways, whatever is not of God, to have transformed minds renewed by the Holy Spirit so we can always know what God's will is and we can do his will, do it well. He tells us to find our gifts our callings within the church so that we can together change the world. Can we see it? I, I don't know about you, but I read these lessons for this week and I'm convicted that I think of myself too highly when it, beca when it comes to being a Christian. When I look at the models that were given in scriptures, have we ever judged ourselves with sober judgment? And then Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, does not let us off the hook this morning either. Far from it. To follow him, we know to follow him is life. We know that, but what does it look like to follow him? And he says it's to deny ourselves. To take up our cross, the means of our death, and lose our lives for his sake. Now, I don't think he necessarily meant we had to, deny, we had to die the death of a martyr, but does that make this any easier? Dying a martyr might be easier than living a life of carrying a cross. Jesus is saying that he wants us fully committed to him. Surrendering our wills, our plans, our wanters, giving him control. You know that old expression, I'm driving my pickup down the road of life. And Jesus is 
so that he's my co-pilot. No, Jesus is, <laughs> Jesus is saying, I'm driving the pickup truck, and you're sitting next to me because I love having you with me, but we're going on my ride. Are you willing to ride with me? Not living a life of our own will, but the will that he has for us, the life he has for us. When we look at our lives with sober judgment in light of these biblical pictures of life, of, of life of faith in God, can we admit that we fall short? I am admitting this morning that I am. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but maybe I'm not the only one that knows that we are not quite where God wants us. Now, despite everything I've said so far, my point this morning is not to depress or to discourage us. No, in fact, I think the first reaction we should have is to rejoice. Rejoice? Wait a minute. Yes, rejoice, because God loves us anyway. Rejoice, because the Lord knowing that we are a half-hearted sort of people, that we do and will far short of what he calls us to do and will, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us anyway. In fact, to die for us because we fall short. He opened the door, the way to eternal life to us anyway. He gives us his Holy Spirit anyway. His Holy Spirit to work in us to will and to do His perfect will, even though we don't, even though we don't get it, even though we don't follow through and don't always surrender and don't even, well, let's be honest, sometimes we don't even want it. So let's rejoice, seriously, in His great mercy, His astounding patience and His love and His forbearance and that He never gives up on us and that He's relentless in his pursuit in us that we would be fully committed laying down our lives even though for now we don't always even want to. But I want to encourage us not again to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Let's know, let's know God's standards in scripture for our lives and judge ourselves with sober judgment knowing how far short we fall and then rejoice all the more that he loves us anyway. And then finally, as a response to where we are, in gratitude for his love and mercy, let's seek the remedy that he provides for our shortcomings and failures. And what's the remedy? You know, because I've been preaching here for almost a year, and so you know what the remedy is. We have lived long enough, most of us, to know that we cannot change our own hearts, we cannot change our wanters, the Remedy for us is prayer. The only remedy. Only the Lord can reach our hearts and change our settings. I think of my heart has got, got a setting. It's either set on me or it's set on him. My wanter is either set on the things of the flesh or the things of God. My heart is set on selfishness or it's set on selflessness, attracted to sin or attracted to holiness, and only God can change the setting. So if we look at ourselves with sober judgment and see that we're short of the life God has for us, which, by the way, is a life of joy and fulfillment and satisfaction and contentment and peace far beyond anything we could have apart from him, if we see that we're falling short, the only way forward is prayer. Asking him to change us. Asking him to give us the desire for what he desires, to give us eyes to see the beauty and joy and satisfaction and contentment that await us in the life that he has for us. Will you pray that prayer? Not someday or next week. Or Actually, next week's fine as long as you don't wait till next week. In other words, it's a prayer we could pray every single morning and every moment. Will we pray that prayer? Will you pray it this morning? And when you come forward today to receive the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you lift your hands, would you lift your life to him afresh? Ask him to fill you afresh with his spirit. Give him permission afresh today to come in and change your heart, 
that you might more faithfully live the Christian life, the life God calls us to live and empowers us to live, if only we are willing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your mercy. I thank that you, Lord, that you have been forbearing with us and that you love us and that you offer to change our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you'd give us grace, each one this day, to submit ourselves afresh to the work of your spirit. We ask in Christ's name, amen. I invite you to stand. We are going to sing the creed this morning. And uh, please, if you would, stand and join with our band. of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop, and Mark, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, Lord, in your mercy. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, Lord, in your mercy. For all those who departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection in thanksgiving, Lord, in your mercy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. You are invited to add your prayers, either silently or aloud. For Colleen and the loss of her dad. Tom and Patty and their new marriage. Johnny. 
Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please greet one another safely sharing God's peace. Peace, Jen. <laughs> I love it. Peace. Please, please, uh, please be seated. I'll tell you what, it's a delight to have uh, so many smiling faces here this morning, even if I can't see your smiles. It's wonderful. <laughs> I know you're smiling. Well, at least you're not shouting uh, negative things. All right, so thank you. A um, couple of quick things. Uh, we're Obviously, we're on three services. New schedule. It's working. Uh, we've had a couple of... Uh, anyway, you put up with us. There's a little bit of uh, adjusting that we're all doing to the, to the new uh, order of worship. An old one come back, but we're delighted that you're with us. Uh, we're still going to live stream at this service and at 11, but we're delighted that you can be here at church with us. Uh, our former rector, Rob Sturdy, will be here next Sunday to lead the services and preach. I, Becky and I will not be here. We're going to Michigan for the, a long weekend to do a wedding for uh, some friends, and we'll be back uh, Tuesday. In, I'll be back in the office a week from this Tuesday. You'll want to be here for Rob. You know Rob. I hope you know Rob. If you don't, you're, uh, you'll know him uh, Sunday. He's wonderful, and you'll have a treat being here. Uh, we have an important message this morning from our treasurer, Nancy Jarrett, who is here. Nancy, you want to come up? If you use a mic, sorry. Okay. Um, I just have a very brief announcement, I guess you could call it. And I have to say, first of all, this is my first time back in this room to worship in it. Pajamas is also good. Um, oh, speak up. Can you hear? Is this on? Now it is. All right, all right. Anyhow, um, I'm putting on um, my treasures hat right now, and um, I just want to encourage everyone to uh, continue providing the financial gifts and pledges to the church. You know, we've been open, even though we've been technically shut down or closed. We've been open and we've been paying our staff and we have electric bills and we've had some other items that we had budgeted for, um, which we have done 
know, cleaning the floors, painting, keeping everything nice and fresh. We've also had a few unexpected expenses. Um, we did have to um, do some plumbing, major plumbing work underneath the church in the drive-through area. We had a lot of clogged pipes and we were flooding the storage unit. And we also have ordered and are awaiting new audiovisual equipment so that we can have better broadcasts. But anyway, the long and the short of it is we are way behind, we're lagging behind in our gifts, financial gifts to the church. In fact, as of the end of July, we were only about 30% there. And I know it's hard when you're not physically in church to um, remember to bring gifts, but I'm hoping this will be a little reminder if you don't feel comfortable giving online, which may seem a little impersonal, you can always write a check and put it in the mail. Um, we uh, do have an offering plate now in the front as a little reminder, but um, I'm just encouraging everybody to please, um, let's try to get back on normal um, in all ways. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. And uh, just, you know, about plates, it's easy to, drop a, a check in when the plate comes by, or it's easier perhaps than carrying something in your hand. On the other hand, this, the symbolism of bringing an offering forward is, is something we've lost in the church, I think. I think it's a, it's, we love to worship in the Episcopal or Anglican tradition physically. We stand, we sit, we kneel, we have our gestures, and we, well, one important gesture is to, bring ourselves and our offerings, our gifts before the Lord. And so that's what I like about having this plate down here is that y'all can come forward and bring to the, to the front, to the cross, if you will, for the work of the church. And so I, I, I love it that it's up here. I don't know if we'll ever go back to passing the plates uh, when it's safe because this, this is a much better image, visual image of what we're doing with ourselves and our resources. Uh, I want you finally just one last thing that prayers continue for the search process. We have, uh, you know, started with a large group, but we're down to a smaller group. And I don't give any specifics here because we're broadcast live and our candidates are watching us. So uh, can't get very specific, but pray for our process. We're, we're uh, well into it and uh, we need wisdom and discernment, continued discernment for our team, our committee for our bishop as he leads us, and particularly pray for the person that God may be calling here. That would be great if we can all hear the Lord's voice together as one. So pray, please, for that. And uh, walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. That's what we're doing when we come forward. We're giving ourselves back to him. In Christ's love, amen. <laughs>
spiritual communion. It's found online or in your bulletin. And for the rest, the Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right to give thanks to it is right, our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet, as our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts 
Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him so that he may dwell in us and we in him. Bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. Apart from your grace, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb.
We thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And now may the Holy Trinity make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God of Jacob. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. When nothing can keep us apart.
Let us go forth in the spirit. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you.